Um, I was recently part of a um, group that visited Hidalgo, and one of the things that we saw there was just incredible community parent support for education. Parents who were who were very supportive of the teachers in that community. That's something we don't see a lot of in North Carolina, unfortunately, or in the United States. So, what's the secret to to developing those systems of parent support, of community support for education for public schools? That's a great question, Sharon. So, we studied in Hidalgo. Uh, Eduardo Consino, one of my students, was the deputy soup when they were doing that. And there was a study that led to it of the 26 elementary and middle schools in Texas that had the highest performance for poor kids. And it turned out that one of our hypotheses was strong community groups. We found virtually none of that. We found in high poverty communities, schools created the community connections. And the messages that schools sent profoundly affected how families interacted. So I'm going to be delicate here, but one of the things we learned in Hidalgo, in studying it, is that many of the Latino parents there come from a culture in which there's undue deference to authority. And their idea of respect initially was stay away and trust the leaders. And Cancino and his team knew this because they were from there. And they really had to explicitly tell the community that respect in this country means engagement. It doesn't mean separation. Which, by the way, is a comment that Immanuel Kant and Aristotle both wrote about. But that was a big issue there. Acculturating people to the sense that we fight for our children and we challenge authority in this country. Right? And that demanding better services is key. And you can see how different Hidalgo is now than Donna, Texas, or other places really close to it. Schools have to think about this. And what happened at Peach Elementary at Hidalgo, we actually set up cameras on the roofs of the schools. And you could see parents walking their kids to school and now coming into the school buildings and sitting down with the kids and eating with them. And the administrators went crazy because this is a violation of state rules. It's all kinds of stuff. And they had to really sit back and think about how to organize themselves for the bigger work how do they work with families to educate their children? Well, this is the classic acculturative mechanism of producing citizens and producing Americans. Now, Hidalgo does have special resources. It does have a community that's very, very tight and has a history of binding together. Just one other example, since you mentioned, I know you know about it, El Paso. El Paso, Utah University of Texas, the community college, and the school districts have been working so tightly together, they use the same assessments in books in their high school, community college, and four-year colleges. They have a different solution. The solution for college readiness in Hidalgo is just make sure that all the students can complete a college course before they graduate, much more than that, in ways that orient them to higher ed. In El Paso, a very similar community, they've actually worked out perfect alignment. When you go into an Algebra two class, wherever you take it, in whichever system, it's virtually the same with the same tests. North Carolina will need to experiment with its own solutions to that. But you have tremendous strengths ready to do that. We have time for one more. Thanks. My question, you mentioned that Algebra for All can become Algebra forever. So trying to prepare students in a rigorous course load for high school and beyond, when should students take algebra and should all students take algebra one or its equivalent in seventh or eighth grade? It's a great question. So right now, when you've gone to four years of mathematics, this is a pregnant question. Because no mathematician that I know, and I know a lot of mathematicians, thinks that every child should take calculus. Mathematics is a very broad domain. It includes statistical thinking, dealing with uncertainty, which is an essential feature of modern life, modeling, and just a historical accident. The only people who used to take more math were going to engineering careers. This is the time, the strong evidence from Michael Handel's Bureau of Labor Studies, 
that a large portion of workers really do need middle school math at a deep level and basic algebra, understanding functions, covariation, the use of symbols to represent numbers. But now we need more pathways. I think we should have a common pathway through Algebra 2, the common core. Then we need a statistics pathway that we're working on. We need a quantitative reasoning pathway. And we need a STEM way that really prepares people for calculus, not ends their mathematical careers. So this is going to be some time for fundamental structural engineering in building pathways that really lead to future higher education and to workplace needs. Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Dana Center have undertaken this with the leading chairs of the education committees of the math societies and have come up with outcomes for this. So Common Core is going to be hard, but many students in North Carolina, I met more than half of them in five years, will have completed the Common Core by the 10th grade. What happens next? It's an enormous opportunity for career readiness, higher ed readiness, and mathematics that's worthy of students and worthy of the disciplines. Thank you.